Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for this opportunity to talk about discrepancies of desire, particularly in asexual relationships. I'm going to start by making an assumption that everybody here has the most basic notions of what asexuality is. Although I realize you may not have knowingly met an asexual person or have worked therapeutically with one. I make no apology, however, for including information you may already know, since there's a very real lack of knowledge about asexuality, even amongst experienced GSRD therapists. Asexuality is most commonly defined as a lack of sexual attraction. That definition is taken from AVEN or the Asexuality Visibility and Education Network, which is a very good source of information about asexuality. I would like to notice the way in which attraction is used as the delineator, rather than behaviour, desire, fantasy, identity, or any other aspect of, it, of sexuality. Have we ever questioned which of these aspects delineates any other sexual orientation? Is a man gay because he has sex with other men? Because he's attracted to other men? Because he fantasizes about other men? Because he desires other men? Or just because he identifies as such? There are some other terms I'm going to use this afternoon which you may not be entirely sure of. Grey asexuality or grey sexuality is experiencing sexual attraction to a very minor degree and often not noticing. And demisexuality, experiencing sexual attraction only when a strong emotional bond has already been established. This person may experience themselves as asexual most of the time. Before I move on to talking about my research project, I would like to pose certain questions about how we understand asexuality. The most basic answer, of course, is that asexuality is a sexual orientation. However, various sociologists have put forward other ideas. Is it a meta-category, i.e. one is either sexual or asexual, with subcategories within each? Or is it an identity? And yes, for some it is. For others, it is just a descriptor of one aspect of their life. I understand asexuality as an umbrella term that covers a multitude of, of aspects of experience, sexual orientation, romantic orientation, other forms of attraction, aspects of preferred relationship styles. For me, it suggests a common point of identification rather than constituting a shared identity per se. In embarking on my research project, I must note that I was attempting to embrace at least three different perspectives. I am asexual, therefore I must position myself inside this exploration to allow myself access to my own feelings, fears, hopes, doubts and experiences. I am a therapist, therefore I must hear these accounts alongside theory, research and best practice. And as a researcher I must also try to position myself as if on the outside looking in at how these stories may be perceived by others. And so on to my project. I have always aspired to be a world changer. Since I came out as asexual just over 10 years ago, that aspiration has of course included educating people about asexuality with a view to making the world a better place for people like me. That aspiration includes challenging other therapists to make our therapy rooms safer and more welcoming for asexual people. Dominic invited me last year to prepare something for this conference on discrepancies of desire in relationships that include asexual people. And I knew straight away that I needed to investigate actual lived experience rather than theorize or imagine. All the people I interviewed were contacted either through existing friendships or two closed groups on social media of which I'm a part, one Scottish and one UK wide. I submitted all my research processes to a few trusted and experienced colleagues in order to be sure that everything I did was safe and respectful for those participating, as I had no academic supervisor or university ethics committee holding me to account. Having obtained all the usual consents, the project had two stages. First, I asked my participants to complete a simple online form, requesting that they chose a pseudonym, and then gave minimal demographic demographic information, including identities, descriptions, etc., and a simple overview of the relationship or relationships they wish to tell me about. 
This was followed up with an interview which was recorded and transcribed. And what I wish to offer you this afternoon is from their lived experiences and as far as possible in their own words. Because of time constraints, I will speak to just three of the main themes that emerged from the interviews. Consent, compulsory sexuality and conversion therapy, and what sex actually is. Other themes emerged in the interviews, all of which you can read about in my full paper, available in the Dropbox. But first, let me introduce you to my participants and give an introduction to desire in the context of asexuality. That's the three concepts. Apple is asexual. He comes from Eastern Europe, but has lived in the UK first as a student and now working part time. He transitioned five years ago, uses he him pronouns, but identifies himself as agender. Apple was the only participant who I interviewed along with his partner. They have an open relationship, but Apple isn't sure how he feels about this. He is in the 26 to 35 year old age bracket. Benny, a grey asexual, originally comes from Southern Europe. She's in her fourth year at university in the 18 to 25 year old age bracket. And the relationship she described was with her ex-partner, who was also a student. She identifies as female and says she prefers monogamous relationships. Jean Lapin, asexual, is Northern European and again came here to the UK as a student, although he now works. He identifies as male. The relationship he described with his partner has ended. His preference for future relationships would be to have a QPR or queer, queer platonic relationship. He's in the 26 to 35 year old age bracket. Kit, a grey asexual, identifies as female and is English. I experienced her as extremely articulate and clear thinking. She describes herself as ambiamorous and talked about her two current relationships, one with her nesting partner and one with her boyfriend, who, she doesn't, who doesn't live with them. She's in the 18 to 25 year old age bracket. Lane, on the asexual spectrum, identifies herself as female non-binary and is from the USA. She was the only participant resident outside of the UK. She's married to her wife and their relationship is monogamous. She is in the 26 to 35 year old age bracket and is a professional writer, also very articulate. Lily, grey asexual, is a student still at university in the 18 to 25 year old age bracket. She identifies as female, is English, and is no longer in a relationship with her boyfriend. She describes her preferred relationship style as open. Nim Rodell, asexual, was the oldest participant and in the 36 to 45 year old age bracket. She's married and has been for 21 years. She and her husband are monogamous and because of a strong Christian faith, didn't have sex until they were married. Nimrodel is English and identifies herself as female non-binary. So that was my seven interviewees. So to talk a little bit about desire in the context of asexuality. Relationships contain many forms of desire. Desires named by, interview, by my interviewees were things like cuddles, companionship, intense conversations, date nights, laughing together, looking after each other, time prioritization, kissing, bodies being close and being held. All these desires and more provide cohesion in relationships. Some have their desires satisfied, most don't all of the time. It was not my intention to restrict the scope of this project to discussions of sexual desire alone, but that was the assumption of all of those with whom I spoke. Until very recently, a lack of sexual desire was understood by the psychological professions with reference to the DSM classification of HSDD, or hypoactive sexual desire disorder, and therefore pathologized as a problem to be rectified. Clinically significant distress was included in the diagnostic criteria for HSDD, 
but without reference to the specific causes of the distress. It is now understood that many GSRD identifying individuals experience clinically significant distress, but that this is a consequence of such things as homophobia, minority stress, shame, and other, other socially triggered processes, rather than by the GSRD identity, identity itself. It was only in the fifth revision of DSM in 2013 that asexuality was mentioned for the first time, stating that diagnoses of HSDD or FSIAD, female sexual interest or desire disorder, should not be applied if the symptoms described could be explained by self-identification as asexual. I have heard from many of my asexual clients and indeed from one of my seven interviewees that this is not universally understood. Clearly, there is still a great deal of ignorance amongst clinicians. Levels of desire varied between the respondents. Lily noted a complete lack of sexual desire. Benny noted a strong desire not to have sex. And Jean Lapin said that he could understand sex, but couldn't feel it, and so stopped wanting it. Lane spoke of only ever wanting, only ever desiring sexual activity with a small number of people with whom she already had a deep emotional connection. Now married, Lane reported that even with her wife, she needed to have some immediate quality of connection before being able to contemplate sexual activity of any kind. Both Lane and Kit knew of the probable discrepancy in sexual desire before their current relationships began and were able to articulate this to their partners. The other five had all felt the pressure from their partners to have sex and realised that sexual desire was mismatched once the relationship was already established. Nim Rodell had never experienced sexual desire, despite being married for 21 years. So move on to talk about consent. Despite two of the participants reporting that they had been subjected to non-consensual sexual assault or rape outside of their current relationships, all seemed to understand the need for consent to be sought and given for sexual contact to be acceptable. However, Benny said, I felt like sooner or later, I had to do it. Jean Lapin noted, I guess I never really consent to have sex and stuff. I just went with the flow. I never really asked myself if I want to do it. And Lily observed, I didn't want to because he was always wanting to and I would go along with it and didn't mind or didn't always mind, but it wasn't something that I wanted. It seems that for some, the combination of shame partner expectations and internalised societal norms make it hard for consent to be sought from oneself before giving consent to the other. It seems from some of the responses in this project that asexual people draw our attention to a deeper consideration of consent. All participants were consenting adults in consensual relationships and yet several were reluctant in giving consent to sexual activity. In order to fully or enthusiastically consent to sexual contact, then the nature of that contact should be agreed actively, not passively. And two skills are required for this to happen. And these are skills that can be practiced and developed, both in the counselling room and in other relationships. The first is checking in with oneself. Is this something I want to do? We could add to that, is this something I want to do now, here? with this person in this context today, connecting with that inner sense of self in order to give consent. The second is being, comfortably, is being comfortable using language required for consent in relationships and using that language regularly. When talking about consent, Lane sets a great example. I think that consent in all areas of a relationship is important. I will actually get consent from someone before venting about a problem to them or asking them for help with something. You know, I'll say, I'm dealing with something and it's hard. And here are some of the things that could be triggering about it. Is it okay if I talk to you? Or I want to ask you a favor, but I first want to let you know that you can say no and it won't affect our relationship. 
resources such as Betty Martin's Wheel of Consent can be useful tools to offer to clients to practice giving and, and asking consent for anything from simple touch to sexual contact. It is even helpful to set a basic example in the therapy room, such as saying, is it okay for you if we talk about, or how much you feel if, So moving on to compulsory sexuality and conversion therapy. The notion of compulsory sexuality in society has been written about elsewhere. It is generally assumed, rightly or wrongly, that partnered relationships are or have been sexual in nature. And contemporary society by and large privileges sexual or nominally sexual relationships over others. It's only since the 31st of December last year, for example, that couples of different genders have been allowed to enter into civil partnerships in England, opening the way for non-sexual unions to be recognised by the state as equal to nominally sexual ones. All but two of the participants talked of feeling shame in relation to perceived expectations of society, which we could understand as internalised oppression. According to Jolapin, society says a man needs to have sex or wants to have sex and she, his girlfriend, would help me to be who I was supposed to be. Nimrodel spoke of the early days of their marriage. I tried to hide it at first because this is what you're supposed to do. And it is sinful to be married and not be having sex. Oh, I'm going to hell. And Lane observed, I think in our society, we have really taught people that if someone doesn't want to have sex right now, or all the time, there is a problem. And, if, and there is something wrong with you if you're not having specific kinds of sex, or sex all the time, or whatever it may be. Additionally, shame and guilt were also reported in relation to depriving a partner of sexual satisfaction. Nimrodel reported that she was asked by her therapist, how is it going to feel for him, you know, if you're not having sex with him? And Apple commented, I was really upset. I was kind of unfair to Jean, not tricking him, but it's kind of unfair to him because he got into a relationship with me and then I'm springing this on him. I was feeling very bad about this whole situation. Shockingly, Nimrodel gave a harrowing account of the journey she and her husband endured seeking a solution for her lack of sexual desire. Initially consulting their church leader, they were referred on to a sex therapist. Nimrodel recounts, at first we were getting shown this whole page spread of willies, which were like, I don't want to see that. And then it was sort of like, all these people feel ashamed of their body or whatever. And I thought, I don't feel ashamed of my body. I like my body, I'm very happy with my body. That's not the problem. I mean, to be honest, I feel like even the sex therapist was out of her depth, that she hadn't encountered anyone asexual. Eventually we stopped going. It was kind of weird because the therapy brought us together in a way, because both of us, it was almost like an unspoken pact that we're going to get out of this therapy. So we did sort of fake a little bit, like it's going well now, it's all fine, it's all right now. But every time sex just felt like I was being raped. And then when the therapist taught me to do the other things, then I just felt like a prostitute. And so I couldn't win really. Presumably the therapist's and the pastor's intentions were good, but both acting out of ignorance caused significant distress to Nimrodel and her husband. Ignorance can be no defense. First, do no harm. The Memorandum of Understanding on Conversion Therapy in the UK provides specific direction to signatories, stating that attempts to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity are both harmful to the individual and unlikely to be successful. MOU2 identifies asexual people as being covered by the understanding. Therefore, it is clear that we risk causing significant psychological damage when we attempt to persuade potentially asexual clients who may have never heard of asexuality, to move in the direction of becoming sexual. I have experienced this as a client, under pressure to step out of my comfort zones, to contemplate doing things I wasn't comfortable with, 
and so have most of my asexual clients. It still shocks me that the National LGBT Survey of 2018 reports that more than 10% of individuals have been either, of asexual individuals have been either offered or have had conversion therapy to correct or change their sexual orientation. This is a higher proportion than for any other sexual orientation. So what is sex? The definition of sex is a question that has never really had more than subjective answers. Famously, former President Bill Clinton insisted that he did not have sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky, despite it later being proved that at the very least he had received oral sex. Male homosexuality was a crime in the UK for many years, but female same-sex relationships were not considered in the same way. Many people believing that two women couldn't have sex because no penis was involved. The respondents in this project gave their own answers to the question, for you, what is sex and what isn't? Benny told me, I guess I used sex in the normal, like in the most used way. And probably I myself still think that sex is about penetration. Real sex is about penetration. Lane, married to her wife, was more specific. We usually define sex as like body to body, with or without sex toys. So even if we don't have sex toys, we would consider it sex if we're connecting our bodies. Lane and Kit were two participants who presented with a good sense of well-being, much less affected by shame and internalised depression than the others. They both spoke positively about their relationships and demonstrated clear boundaries, clear consent, and advanced communication skills with their partners. I think it's not a coincidence that both of their stories included dynamics in their relationships of kink, BDSM, and non-vanilla sex. Kink challenges the notion that sexual activities must include genital contact and orgasm, although they may. Those involved in the kink scene will develop the capacity to communicate clearly about limits, boundaries, and consent which makes this world quite attractive to asexual people for its clarity and safety, not to mention the possibility of intimacy and connection without genital sex being assumed as inevitable. Lane and Kit both demonstrated what one researcher described. BDSM provides asexual individuals with uniquely effective tools for setting unconventional boundaries and reformulating dominant scripts about how sexual desire should manifest and be valued, in effect creating spaces where they can express affections that do not implicate sexual attraction. As therapists aiming to work competently with asexual clients, whether they identify as such or not, we can be effective in holding an open space for exploration of what kinds of intimacy and connection they may find appealing. So looking ahead, until recently, asexuality was the only GSRD identity that was negatively defined by an absence of something rather than a presence. This left the impression of a vacuum, of an empty space. To date, most research has focused on what is lacking rather than what is present and fulfilling. Intriguingly, we now use phrases like gender non-conforming, consensual non-monogamy, non-binary gender and non-monogamous sexualities, all of which, despite describing what they are not, lead to an opening up rather than a closing down of possibilities, to expansiveness rather than limitation. This project began with the notion that discrepancies in desire can be problematic in relationships. And rather than solely focusing on the pain and difficulty experienced by asexual clients, although this too is vital, we can help them find, to find the language, to discuss forms of intimacy that are simply not reducible to sex and sexuality. And that further challenged the Freudian doxa that the sexual is at the base of all things. I would like to end with a performance piece by Cameron Awkward Rich called A Prude's Manifesto. This is from 2015, if I can play it. This is a prude's 
manifesto. Here is a list of things I like more than having sex. Reading. <laughs> Lying flat on my back, staring at the ceiling. <laughs> Peeling back the skin of a grapefruit. Watching the old man who lives in my backyard smoke weed until he becomes his lawn chair. <laughs> Oatmeal. <laughs> Wet paint. Strong coffee, cheap whiskey, riding my bike away from parties. How the night swallows me like a dragon, the wet heat of one body alone, etc., etc., etc. Amen. <laughs> Often, I fantasize about tying a blonde boy down to his own bed, leaving him splayed and panting and then uh, just leaving. <laughs> just walking out the door. So yes, in one version of the story, prude is synonym for sadist, for vengeful puppeteer. <laughs> in the other version of the story, love rises early to put the water on the stove. Love is a girl who slept beside me, barely touching for two years. Love is whatever kept us fed. And this is how we knew that we belonged to it. And after, when I am leaving, when we finally spend time inside each other's bodies, it is mostly to appease all the friends who've looked in on our sexless bed and called it sham or called it shame. And then when she says want, it's like she's speaking with someone else's mouth. And when I touch her, it is with someone else's hands. If orgasm is really what makes the body sacred, then the best love I have ever known was sin or sacrilege. So praise also the calm and quiet house. Praise also the most mundane affections, how the body can be satisfied to lie pinned beneath the ceiling of the sky. And how many times have I heard that my body is holy? And how many times has someone held a mirror to my naked and named that beautiful? And how many times has love tried to train the shame back out? Listen, I have been made ghost and reborn as flesh. I have locked the body in the bedroom. I have given someone else the key. I have burned down the whole apartment. I am beautiful. I am holy. I am unashamed. Amen. So often when someone tells me that I should just love myself, sounds more like they would like me to let them love me the way they want to. But the animal of my body won't come for anyone but me. But me who feeds it, who bathes it in the river, who lays us down beneath the skin of stars, and what is that but loyalty, but undivided love. Yes! And so I finish with some questions for discussion. Examine your feelings. What goes through your mind when a client tells you they have very low or absent sexual desire? In what ways might GSRD friendly therapy unwittingly and unintentionally collude with conversion therapies for asexual clients? And discuss ways you may be able to help asexual clients look for expansiveness in their intimate relationships. Thank you.